Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome yet again to another episode of The Ken Show. My name is Corey DeVos. I am the Editor-in-Chief of Integral Life, and I'm joined once again by the one and only Ken Wilbur. How you doing, Ken? Good, buddy. Good, man. It's great to have you here again. Yep. Uh, though I suppose it's, you know, an open question whether you actually consciously chose to be here today or if you're destined to do this show by the unseen forces of the cosmos. Ever since um, the Big Bang. <laughs> which, exactly, which I guess is, you know, one of the things that we're going to hopefully begin to uh, untangle today yeah. at the end of our conversation. Um, that part's not hard. <laughs> well... Because today we're going to be, in fact, talking about uh, one of the oldest and in many ways it's one of the most profound and consequential philosophical questions in history, uh, which is this, what is the nature of free will? Right. Is it ultimately just an illusion? And of course, you know, Ken, this is such a massive question. Um, it's got implications that range from, you know, philosophy to spirituality uh, psychology, art and creativity, neurobiology, evolutionary theory, morality, ethics, I mean, to the very foundations of our legal system, really. Yep, absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really excited for you to, you know, shine a bit more integral light on this, on this question. And before we start, um, I thought I'd make a few comments just to, you know, help get the discussion going. Um, so, you know, first off, it seems to me that there, there really is some notion of free will that's, that's actually baked right into the core of your integral model. Sure. Um, you know, in other words, we, we often talk about how, you know, with every single moment, every single occasion, there's, there, there arises an opportunity for creativity. There's an opportunity right. to make a choice, to, to send evolution spiraling yeah. off in some different direction. It's, it's the creative advance into novelty, as, right. as Whitehead put it, that gives rise to evolution as we know it. It pulls molecules out of atoms and, and cells out of molecules and organisms out of cells all the way, you know, all yep. the way up the chain. Yep. And in order for creativity to exist, there presumably must be some agent somewhere that's, that's making a choice. Um, so that's, that's one piece. The other piece is... You know, that's the creativity piece. The other piece is, you know, we often talk about how the first person perspective, the perspective of the person speaking, my interior consciousness, this is not an emergent of evolution, like it's often seen to be. But, you know, the, what you posit is it's actually baked into the cosmos all the way from the very beginning. It's, you know, the universe, you often say, it's not constructed out of particles or atoms or angels it's not made out of parts or holes or even holons it's ultimately made out of perspectives right. and one of the fundamental perspectives that really forms the fabric of this universe is indeed the the first person perspective the perspective right. of interiority um right. and you know we make the claim that this interiority exists at all levels of reality not just the human level it's basically, you know, sentient turtles all the way up and, and all the way down. So we got two pieces there. We've got the creativity piece and we've got the interiority piece. And both of these, you know, they seem necessary for any meaningful discussion of free will. But at the same time, they don't really seem synonymous with They're free not. will. Um, it, it doesn't seem right to say that, you know, in the early unfolding of the universe, atoms were willing molecules into existence, even though, you know, we allow there an integral panentheistic view allows for atoms to possess some, you know, tiny little sliver of proto consciousness, uh, and as well as a capacity to express some degree of evolutionary creativity, or else we never would have gotten this universe, you know, running, it would have stalled out from the very beginning. Right. But, you know, again, it doesn't quite seem the same as free will, at least as we commonly use it. I mean, I'm not I'm not sure if even my dog possesses something like free will, even though I'm, you know, I'm pretty confident she's got some form of interiority and even some capacity for creative choice. But again, I'm not sure that's, that's really enough for, for free will to, to emerge. So one of, you know, one of the first questions I have for you, and I'll, I'll, I'll run through this and then, you know, I'll actually give you a chance to talk here, but I'm wondering, you know, is it correct to say that, you know, free will, so consciousness, 
interiority, creativity, these are not evolutionary emergence, but maybe free will is, or, you know, to put it another way, maybe free will is something that occurs at the intersection of interiority and creativity at the level of the human holon. So, so, you know, it gets filtered through another evolutionary emergent, which is self-reflexivity and the capacity to make subject into object. So I'm wondering, you know, is free will merely the result of making our own interiority and our own creativity into an object of awareness? Finally, last little part of this first question, um, you know, obviously if you're a scientific materialist and you only believe in third person realities, then there's obviously no room, there's no space in your worldview for something like free will because there's no room in your worldview for your own first person perspective. It's, it's you know, it, the philosophers like Daniel Dennett and Richard Hawkins and many others, they've, they've made entire careers, you know, sort of using their own creativity to explain why creativity is actually just an illusion. Um, meanwhile, I think every major artist in history knows firsthand that free will is anything but an illusion. And, you know, Ken, I, I wrote you last night because something really kind of funny and um, auspicious happened, which was, you know, I was preparing for this show and I got a notification on my, own, on my iPhone um, that there was a new episode of a podcast by Neil deGrasse Tyson, his Star Talk podcast. And uh, it was titled, you know, we're, we're calling this show, Is Free Will an Illusion? The name of his podcast that came through last night to me was uh, The Illusion of Free Will. So I, I thought that was kind of funny. And the podcast features a discussion with Sam Harris, um, who, you know, I don't think Sam can be fairly lumped in with Dennett and Dawkins and Hitchens and the rest of those guys. But he, you know, he does offer some really interesting critiques of this notion of free will. Um, and it's interesting because he approaches it from sort of an upper right neurobiological perspective. And then he shifts into sort of a more Zen Buddhist upper left perspective. And, you know, before I get you started, Ken, I wanted to just briefly play. I've got a two minute clip um, and I'll play that real, real quickly so that we can sort of use that as a starting point. So let me just, uh, all right, here we go. When you look at the, the scientific details, we know that for instance, a, a voluntary motor action is preceded by neuroanatomical events that we can detect, you know, with EEG or with fMRI, which precede your conscious awareness of having made a decision. So at a moment where you subjectively think you're still making up your mind and you're still free to choose door number one versus door number two, we can detect with now with, you know, very high probability that you're going for door number two at, at, in pre precisely an interval where you think you, you, you're still just figuring it out, right? So that's a, a fairly stark insult to this Completely. Pre pretension of, of having free will. Completely. Yeah, yeah. But what I would say is that even if nothing precedes your choice except your choice, right? So let's say, let's say your thought, like, I'm going to go for door number two, right? Let's say that is the, the first cause, right? There's nothing, there's, there's, there's no neurochemistry we need to talk about prior to that. Let's just say that that's even the action of your, your immortal soul, right? That, you know, that is just integrated with the brain somehow and pulling the strings. That thought, that the fact that it emerges rather than some other thought, which is door number one, the fact that it is effective, all of that is absolutely mysterious, right? Like it's simply, you can't think a thought before you think it. It just springs into view, right? And it's springing into view is totally compatible with a lack of freedom. And no, no matter how you, you massage the physics, whether it's pure determinism or determinism plus some randomness, it, neither of those dials gives you free will. So yeah, that's Sam Harris's take, which I imagine is gonna be a little bit different from your take. So. What do you think about all this, Ken? What, what exactly is free will? Um, is it something we actually possess or is it sort of an elaborate illusion that's created post hoc by, you know, the hall of mirrors uh, inside the human mind? What do you think? Yeah. Um, well, uh, all of these is, I saw all the questions that were asked. Um, it, there were so many different topics and so many different areas and I wanted to make sure that we 
didn't leave anything out, that I didn't leave anything out. So I'm, I made a series of, of notes. And so uh, you can forgive me if I, if I um, read some no, of No, that's, that's great. I've scratched down here. Uh, and, and then uh, interrupt any time, ask any kind of questions you want. But I want to give a bit of a background to, to, uh, to this overall conversation. Um, because I, it's always important and the dull part of a conversation, which is to actually, in a sense, sort of define terms and say, right. wait a minute, just what do you mean by that? And notoriously, the free will determinism argument has, and we'll go over this in just a minute, has at least three very, very different meanings of freedom. Mm. And people will explicitly state sort of their version of freedom and then give the argument within that. And it's not even addressing the other kinds of freedom. <laughs> and of course, as an integralist, our first general tendency is whenever any number of different perspectives are offered, that our initial tendency is to believe that all of them have some degree of truth. True, but partial. Yep. And the idea is that uh, you know, the human mind can't just produce 100% error. There's all of these different views are held by a community of people that are intelligent, thoughtful, conscientious. They're um, heart of gold, pure intentions, trying to come up with the right thing. And yet, and yet they're all pre-committed to just one perspective that doesn't include the others. And the mm -hmm. argument occurs within those fragmented definitions. And so we're going to go through and, and clean some of that up, point the ones that are there, and then point out how all of them have a place, mm -hmm. not as their own absolutistic statement, but as true but partial components of this overall um, area. Awesome. Um, it, most of the forms of, and I'll just read down some of the introductory stuff I had, most of the forms of this argument are absolutistic. Um, they either have uh, a, a kind of belief in total freedom or we're totally determined. Um, and in fact, neither one of those absolutistic uh, uh, versions of those exist. Um, it's just uh, not in the relative world. Mm. And so what we really have to look at is, hey, wait a minute, we have to say, what do we mean by relative freedom and relative determination? Um, because it's not just the case that absolutely every single thing in the universe is 100% determined. Uh, we gave that view up in the 1920s with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Right. And quantum realities are, have a categorical indeterminism built into them. And nobody denies that now. There's no way around it. There's even, uh, just in the past couple of years, um, a group of physicists that presented what they called a free will theorem. And they were simply saying, we have two options. Either the world is deterministic and we don't have free will, or the world is indeterministic and we do have the possibility of free will. And I don't believe it's that sharp. It, it's not quite that either or, but their point's straightforward. And they were representing the vast consensus of the physical community that reality is, has an indeterministic component to it. And there's just no way around that. Um, that's been accepted physics for over a century now. And all of the uh, even recent flurry of experiments done to test that has just reconfirmed it. Mm. And so, so in terms of just a hardcore determinism, 
That's just categorically false. It doesn't occur. That doesn't mean that there isn't relatively strong deterministic currents. There are. Mm -hmm. And we're going to find in the whole sort of deterministic stream of things, as well as the sort of freedom stream of things, there's actually a whole spectrum of more or less determined, more or less free. There's never just this is radically free or this is radically deterministic. Right. That's almost the only way that the argument unfolds is with people arguing those extremist views, none of which exist. I mean, they're just all kind of straw man. So um, historically, there has um, there have been two sort of broad major views um, about how freedom, free will, and determinism fit together. Um, one of the, the uh, major views are just called incompatibilities. And mm -hmm. they simply believe that freedom and determinism are just incompatible. You, one or the other can't have both. So in philosophical terms, the belief that there's just, certainly at least in the moral sphere, that we have real freedom with no determination, uh, that's technically called a libertarian view. Now, that, that's not what libertarian means in, in general discourse. It's not what it means in politics. In politics, it usually means something like the government better keep its hands off my ass. It doesn't have any right to tell me what to do, all that, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, screw you, I got mine. <laughs> exactly. Um, but here, philosophically, the kind of original meaning of it is that free will is genuine, it's real, and it's contra determinism. Mm -hmm. And then the opposite of that, of course, within the incompatibilist viewpoint, are those who believe in just strict determinism. Everything is determined. Um, this is often called uh, hard determinism. Um, and um, because everything is determined, there's no free will. Right. Now, we'll see later that this is a, gets involved in the confusion of just what freedom means, because there are at least three major meanings of freedom. They apply to different quadrants. Mm. All of them are real. This is arguing only one type of freedom. And so it's not going to cover the bases. It won't work. Right. But they, they take this argument, and they try to make it apply to all of the bases. And that's classic reductionism in terms of how integral would see something like that. Yeah. So um, they do agree on one thing, which is that freedom and determinism are incompatible. And that's why they're called incompatibilities. Then the other major group is called, rather unimaginatively, the compatibilities. And they believe one way or another, these two things can fit together. Mm. Now here, invariably, they shift the meaning of what they mean by freedom. And we'll come back to that. We're just talking generically. Um, the compatibilities will say, no, 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 they're not incompatible. They're actually compatible. Both of them can be true in various ways, and we can fit those um, together. Uh, sometimes, because they do accept determinism, but they don't see it as governing human free will, they're sometimes called soft determinists. But one way or another, compatibilists attempt to make room for both of those views. And there are several different ways that's done. Um, but it's a fairly uh, popular uh, um, approach, largely because what we're really dealing with here, when we think about something like determinism and then something like free will, is we're thinking about whether these are strictly true in an ontological sense, 
we can have experiences where we believe both of those are true and they both make sense and so somehow we don't want to just say well only one of those is true and the other is totally false because it just doesn't fit with our native experience where we can find truth in both of them